Go ahead and do an audio check real quick. Mm, almost, not quite. Is this? Oh, I see it's live. Do we have audio? Do we? Well, do you? Twitch. We do have audio. All right, I think we're good. Uh -huh. Now that I loaded it, let's see. Um. Okay. You ready? Yep. Oh, <clears throat> Two sixty-seven. Okay. Hold on. <clears throat> okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two sixty-seven of the Security Podcast here on the In Thirty Network. I'm hi, I'm Thomas. I, I don't know. He's there. He's behind the windows. I'm here. And we're using Discord's extreme noise canceling. So Tom will be silent until he's not. So I guess that's a good thing. Uh, generally, most people would prefer for me to remain silent. Uh, that's what I'm, what I'm learning. Well, usually that's always the right answer. It's better to remain silent. I, I think the famous Homer J. Simpson said this, or at least pretended to say this. It's better to stay silent than to open your mouth and remove all doubt, <laughs> which has happened in the last few days. There's so much idiocy going on. But anyway, um, just some programming notes. We contacted, Drew, if you don't know Drew Curtis, he's the founder of FARC.com. He's been on not this show, but he's been around. You've heard him before. He said he would absolutely love to talk software patents. We have a software patent show we want to talk about, and Tom's going to explain software patents really well. But Drew fought a software patent troll, and it was the episodic link aggregation patent. So if you post a bunch of links on a website that's counted as news, that is in violation of some patent that they fought and won. So, so it's better to hear it from him and I will say it won't be safe for work, but whatever. Um, the problem is he gets very, he has too, too good of a Wednesday night uh, social habit that, that he just has to find time. But anyway, so I don't know, Tom, do you fill your, so do you often fill your ga your car up with plastic bags filled with gasoline? No, no, of course not. I, I wouldn't do something so ridiculous. The the gas goes in the car, as we know. So I really just roll down the window in the back seat and just start pray and spray. That's it. Like, uh, and as soon as the like the seats are well soaked with that gasoline, I know I've got enough to get to my next destination. Like I'm thinking exhibit in Pit My Ride, he makes a pool in the back of your car and you just like we drain it with water, we just fill it with gasoline. Yeah. Like that that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I have no issues with that. And you can do it even better. Like if you because that's not gonna show up in your fuel gauge because it's like extra bonus fuel. If you use one of those like limousine dividers or like a fancy taxi divider, uh if it's clear, you can just look behind you and be like, Oh yeah, see, like I've got three quarters of a tank. It's like right here at this line. So uh we're we're good. And as long as you make sure to never hit that like down partition button, you're fine. So you have no idea what we're talking about. Um, the Consumer Product Safety Board issued a tweet that basically said, please do not fill up plastic, do not use plastic bags to fill gasoline. And you're like, who would do such a thing? But yet there are pictures of people. So let's take another step back. So the, our, our main topic today is uh, specific ransomware, but specifically uh, the Colonial Pipeline. So it's this pipeline that serves the Southeast United States. It's very large. It's the lar It's one of the largest free flow like gas pipelines. And it was hit with a ransomware attack. And we don't know too many details, but we do know that, that if everyone just continued about their daily life, nothing bad was gonna happen. Uh, maybe the cost of gas would go up a few cents for a week or two, but nothing like crazy bad's gonna happen. 
But as soon as somebody said that there may be an issue, all hell broke loose. And everyone is like panic buying. Like, remember toilet paper? They are panic buying the equivalent of toilet paper. And they are literally putting gas into plastic single use bags and holding it in some weird way. Like, I wish they had like the milk jugs. Maybe the milk jugs would be better. <laughs> So, um, in, in case in case somebody doesn't catch the sarcasm, uh, please, please don't do this. Um, if you are going to get it on video, though, and uh, you can join our signal group and uh, share that with us, because um, we we would love to to laugh at that. Uh, we we gasoline need goes, yeah, a gasoline goes in red containers that are certified to hold gasoline. And I know that the gas stations do this because I brought a blue container, which is for kerosene, but I put a big sticker on it that says gasoline on it because I needed to store gasoline. And they said no. So that means that this no name, really shady gas station had some morals. And by the way, I live in a full service state where where the reason we have full service is because a New Jersey state senator said that he's afraid of the bears. So the gas station attendants are well trained in hunting bear to protect you, but you don't have to get out of your car and someone else pumps your gas. So, yeah. So, uh, just in case you're you're not aware, um, the reason uh, those red gas containers are are certified and and people like if they're paying attention will will get a little bit concerned if you try to put gasoline into anything else. It's that gasoline, believe it or not. Uh, is kind of corrosive. And if you put it in the wrong container, it can eat a hole in it and spill out everywhere. So, um, yeah, those plastic bags, I mean, not only is that form factor just the wrong, absolute wrong thing for gasoline, uh, but depending on the type of plastic they're made out of, they may or may not be safe from the gas actually eating through it, melting through it, and then uh, leaving a puddle of gasoline wherever those bags were. Um, yeah, get get yourself some some red containers. And by the way, if uh, if you're panic buying gasoline, um, do me a favor and don't. Or just it's trade really your not car, that bad. Trade your car in for an electric car, and you don't have this problem. But I was going to say, you've clearly never bought milk in in a plastic bag. I have not. No, uh, okay. no I they... have bought milk in a plastic <laughs> bag. That is the thing. My my neighbors, if you are in north. Um, have experience with that. Uh, I have not because uh, I am a filthy American. Because you could buy, I mean, if milk could go in a plastic bag, surely gasoline can. <laughs> surely any liquid could be in a plastic bag. Now, I have bought corrosive liquids in plastic bags uh, when I bought boxed wine in college, and I have not made that mistake in a lot of years. Okay, so so aside from all of this, now that we got the safety out of the way, yes, red red certifiable containers should be holding plas- uh, gasoline. Your car should be holding gasoline. There's no there's no need to panic buy gasoline. Just like there was no need to panic buy toilet paper. But the whole story goes, um, and we're gonna link to a Brian Krebs article. By the way, this is Brian Krebs, not Chris Krebs. They're two different people. They both do awesome work, but they are two different people. Um, this pipeline that extends from, I guess, Texas to, it looks like to, uh, top of Virginia, but like extensions into New Jersey suffer. This company suffered uh, a ransomware attack. And so instead of paying the ransom or before they dealt with it, they just literally shut down the pipeline that moves an insane amount of uh, refined gasoline throughout the country or throughout this lower part of the United States. And, and so Couple that with the fact that we can't get truck drivers to actually deliver this gas and the country reopening and people buying more gas and everything else, ticking up demand. That was this perfect storm for a real big problem. That That's essentially the story. And they're working on, I think they just opened it. So if you're hearing this Wednesday, it's Wednesday night, 1030, that they started reopening it. So again, it was okay. But now we have to talk about ransomware and industrial control systems. Yeah, so like even even if the pipeline didn't open for a little while, because of the kind of depressed demand for refined gasoline due to COVID and lockdowns, people just not going places. Um, 
you know, all all the officials, uh, energy officials in the United States generally agree. Yeah, that's probably isn't going to be like a huge issue because we'd have to run for a while to even get into like shortage territory, like even, you know, sideways glance territory at, at the type of stuff that's happening here. Now, it's it's not good. Right. You never want to shut down a, a gas pipeline like this or really any pipeline. But, you know, it, it happened and it's not honestly a huge deal. But, uh, yeah, people got wind of it and you know, society does what society does and kicked up a big dust storm over nothing. So the issue then becomes now this is the second or third ransomware attack on industrial control system in the last few weeks, uh, mainly the beginning of the year. The same Florida uh, water treatment plant was almost hit twice, and not really with ransomware, but just plain stupidity. So that story goes where they had TeamViewer running to insert chemicals into the water system, like fluoride, or I don't know if they, I don't know if fluoride has been canceled, I think, but whatever it is that they, that they, uh, it used to be iodine to filter the water that they were doing it. So they had literally like a computer connected to the internet being run by TeamViewer to do this. And the only reason it got so, something happened, but the guy saw the mouse moving and quickly canceled it. And I'm thinking to myself, how is this allowed? And I guess the answer is that not that there's no regulation, but no one knows. I, I don't think anybody with, with ideas have come into the room saying this is a bad idea. Yeah, uh, generally uh, having your country's critical infrastructure connected to the net um, or, or <clears throat> let me let me even further qualify that because, you know, like some Internet connected stuff might be cool, like getting a live uh, a live feed of like metrics from the water treatment plant like that. That'd be interesting. That'd be kind of cool to know. And, you know, frankly, it might be. Uh, yeah, kind of neat for average citizens to be able to look at these metrics and you know make determinations, kind of like an open government project sort of deal. Um, but uh, yeah, when it comes to actual control systems and being able to say this much of this chemical goes into this water supply, that sort of thing, uh, those control systems should never be connected to the internet, especially if it's just local. If it requires somebody like an on-call pager rotation, like oh no, this thing you know needs to be rebooted, or this this thing is throwing errors, or there's a problem here, paging somebody and having them drive in is not the end of the world because typically your industrial control systems are in the locality where your people are, right? It's all in the same spot. It's not like you have to get on a plane to go fly somewhere to get to a water treatment plant. Um, now, somebody is going to correct me. Somebody is going to yell about, like, Alaska, remote towns. Okay, we can cross that bridge when we come to it. But I would say for the vast majority of these control systems, they should not be on internet-connected boxes at all. I mean, I don't know what it takes to add the chemical to the system, but I feel like it's a little more difficult than pushing a couple buttons, but maybe it's pushing three buttons. Like, I feel like... Well, in this case, I, I, I don't I don't remember the story too. It was an internal attack. So the person who wanted to wanted to screw over his buddies or screw over or whatever was just recently fired or whatever it is and knew the code. Like they didn't steal the code, but when you hear team viewer and you hear remote access, everyone starts cringing to say, Really? That's what it is. It wasn't that they got hacked, it was it was an internal thing. But this is the problem with and and the problem is I, I'm I'm sure we've said this for years. I mean, I don't think I'm we're the first. This is not the first time we've said, "Hey, you've got to secure all this stuff." Um, and the problem is that when you start looking at it, you realize that it's not, and we have bigger problems. And look there at your was, organization. Yeah, go. There was a uh, a company I worked for. Um, this is like over ten years ago at this. Point. So, uh, you know, what I'm saying is probably invalid. Um, don't don't yell at anybody on my resume, please. That's just idiotic. Um, but we did uh, kind of an investigation on whether or not uh, certain equipment, like physical equipment in a lab, should even be accessible to the internal company network because we did have a VPN to get into the company. And from there, you know, did, did we want engineers to have control over this equipment? And we ultimately decided these things have moving parts 
while we can you know secure this in such a way where the worst thing that they can do is like ruin a batch of test equipment we still don't want to take that chance with our people with safety so we left it completely disconnected uh to get into this network you actually have to go to a building and go to the equipment and hook up right there on the panel uh just because we wanted to be extra safe and frankly i think that conversation is something that probably needs to be had in any uh, networked or connected or electronic infrastructure, uh, right? Like, what is the absolute worst case scenario if somebody gets uh, somebody gets access to this stuff? And is that worth the trade-off of the inconvenience of needing to physically be somewhere to do a job? Uh, in our case, it wasn't worth it, right? We took a look at the safety trade-offs, we took a look at the convenience trade-offs, and we said, eh, we're fine with the inconvenience as long as it keeps people safe. And honestly, in that case, yeah, I still to this day agree that we did the right thing and I, most importantly management agreed with us they said overwhelmingly you're the experts here sure we'll we'll do the inconvenient thing because it's safer i mean and that that is i mean kudos to them because i mean we just hear story after story after story I mean, my, my work was hit with, uh, I sent you the word. It wasn't called a ransomware attack. They called it something weird, like not encryption malware, but crypto malware. I, I don't know what it was. Um, <clears throat> and for whatever reason, it didn't seem like it got too far. It just means that all the systems had to be shut off and they, they, they caught it in time, whatever it was. But again, we still talk about this is that what happens if. And you find out that that security budgets and IT budgets are stretched so thin that all these these uh, insurance policies end up end up not happening. Uh, the the backups went from every hour to every couple of days, and and oh, we segmented this network, but not that network. We're getting lax. Everyone's working from home, and we didn't buy VPNs for everybody, so it's just like please don't do it. So the little things like that, but let. I want the time to explain the terms of service of what Darkside did because I mean this is this is hilarious. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like it's. I I know that some some of these like ransomware as a service uh, providers, which by the way, if you didn't know that they exist, yeah, there's an entire like dark web like underground cottage industry uh, of people running quite literally cloud services where you can. Uh, like generate or pay for a ransomware attack against a company of your choosing. Like it's kind of ridiculous. Um, but apparently they they have a terms of service. Uh, they they go and they say, uh, yeah, we uh, we kept looking around for products in this uh, in this industry and we couldn't find anything that met our needs, so we built one. Like it, it's a startup pitch basically as as ransomware. Um, but they, they go into this and they say, yeah, we're, we're not going to attack uh, anyone in the medical industry. Um, we're, we're not going to attack uh, anything in the government sector because we're apolitical. We, we just don't want to deal with any of that stuff. Uh, no nonprofits, no education, no funeral services. Like, okay. They, they understand that what they're doing is wrong, it's illegal, it's immoral, and it is hurting people. But they have a code of conduct <laughs> that specifies that there are just certain places they will not go. Um, okay. Like, I, I don't want to say that, like, it's, it's less bad. It kind of clearly is less bad than somebody who would do anything for, you know, uh, a quick buck. But I, I can't say, like, they're good. I don't see these people as Robin Hood. Uh, I just see them as, you know... Um, people causing damage and scamming people uh, with maybe a little bit of morals just sprinkled on top, like just as a garnish. Um, but yeah, apparently they also have like, uh, just like a lot of these services, they have a full help desk where people who have had their files encrypted uh, will do everything from manage like costs, negotiation, providing like a, a test file to be decrypted just to prove that they can. Um, it's kind of interesting one thing that uh that uh, dark side does that other uh crypto ransomware services uh i i haven't seen do commonly uh is not only do they encrypt your data they steal your data uh and they put it on a bunch of cdns and they say yeah you've got this much time 
uh, before not only um, the the price will go up, but then even further, if you keep waiting, we're just going to release your files to the net and anybody can have them. Uh, like, it's it's quite literally a two-part ransom of part one, your files are encrypted and only we can decrypt them, and then part two is if you don't want your stuff leaked on the net, uh, you're going to have to pay us for that privilege. Uh, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's basically, I mean, they're driving a hard bargain. They want the money. And, and again, their help desk probably answers the phone on a couple of rings rather than your call is important to us. Please wait while we get somebody like there's probably no, no waiting there. It's, they'll probably answer you. And I mean, we keep on saying, so if you haven't followed the ransomware trail, it's basically your organization gets hit. You call your insurance company, which you sh- it, I'm if you don't have insurance for you, maybe now you start thinking about it. And when you do get hit and there's no guarantee that you won't get hit again. I mean, it's, it's not like a one-time deal. You could get hit again. It's the insurance company makes a decision and says, how much is it going to cost for us to, to solve this problem versus how much does it pay to fix it? Now, the answer is you should never pay. If nobody paid, there won't be a problem as a business point of view. The problem is no one wants to be that person that says, no, we're going to take that moral high ground. We need our data back. So they're going to pay and the, the cycle goes through. Um, I really do like the, we'll give you one file. And then the other thing is if you pay and then the people don't do it, Nobody else is going to pay. So if you're going to say, hey, we're going to decrypt it, you have to decrypt it. So I like the idea that they do have, how do you do this? How do you do this? Because I always, under, like, we can't explain Bitcoin to the normal person. And yet they're making people buy Bitcoin. Like, what do you do? You call the intern and say, hey, who's the one who knows about Bitcoin? Can you help us? <clears throat> I guess they have a mechanism there. Um I don't know. You call, you, you have to go through tour. You have to do this. I, I don't know. Like, is there like a secret number? I guess they have a secret number because I wonder if they get like uh, car warranty ads to their, uh, to their help desk as well. But I don't know. I feel like they have this thing and they're going for it and you have to play a hard bargain because if it's, Hey, I need a few more days and I need a few more days, you're never going to get the money. So you have to say, sorry, and go with it. Uh, I, I, I do think it's reprehensible to say, Hey, you, if you don't pay us, we're going to sell your data to the highest bidder. I think that's that's hurting a lot of people who may not have um, any like any say. Like, I don't have say how my doctor's office stores data. If you ran somewhere the doctor's office, I didn't cause that. I can't sue the doctor. I I feel like that's a little bit. I mean, maybe push to get it, but don't actually do it. But yeah, they they they've claimed in. Because they, they put out press releases like this operates like a startup. It's an evil startup for sure, but it operates like a startup. They put out press releases saying we don't really want to impact the normal people in society. We just want to target rich companies and make money. That's literally why we're here. We're here to make money. Uh, but I, I think uh, there's some cognitive dissonance that I'm sure they're aware of. Uh, we're all aware of it, right? Just like you're saying... If a company I use is just a regular user, a normal member of society, gets hit with this, my information gets leaked or sold to the highest bidder, or encrypted, and the company that I use for whatever can't, you know, provide me the services I'm I'm paying for, uh, yeah, that that impacts. That that really does. Um, apparently, they didn't mean to attack an oil pipeline, or it wasn't part of their like approved list. But it it happened, right? And the people buying these services and the people paying uh, these like uh, crypto ransomware, uh, crypto locker, you know, as a service companies, those buyers probably aren't the most ethical and they probably don't care about your terms of service. Um, Just throwing that out there. If I've reached the point as an individual where I am paying for ransomware as a service, your terms of service page on, uh, like, underneath your buy button really doesn't affect me all that much, as long as I get what I want. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a, a messed up situation. I mean, I would like the bleeping computer people to ransomware as a service, the ransomware as a service people. I mean, troll the trolls. Pay us. Are we and we don't disclose you to all the three letter agencies. I mean, that that's what that's what I want. Let's play yeah. play the game back. Uh, 
or give us all your money. Here are your choices. Because you're a troll, so you don't have any data. We either leak your location or you pay us. If uh, if you'd like to see, um, you know, kind of how how a customer service interacts uh, or interaction with a targeted uh, and a victim company, um, the this Krebs on Security article has a bunch of great screenshots of. The conversation had between you know this victim company or the representative this victim company chose uh, and the support personnel for the crypto ransomware you know startup evil people um, and yeah it looks like they're they're really driving a hard bargain. There's like talking here like look we we know what your company's financials are. You're not poor. You can pay this amount uh, and if you don't you know that's that's just too bad for you. Um, but they, they do agree to a few things. Um, you know, these, these kinds of outfits live and die by the trust that uh, the world puts in them. And unfortunately, yeah, people are choosing to pay and trust. Um, so they're swearing up and down, we won't attack you again. We're not going to show anybody how to attack you again. We're even going to give you a pen test report to show you how to not get attacked again, which I find really interesting. And I would love to see one of those reports. Of course, like it's super, super confidential, right? Um, but I would love to see kind of what quality bar are these pen test reports written at? Because I've read a few. I've written a few. Um, it would be interesting to me to to see how it lines up with the actual, you know, pen testers and infosec personnel in the industry. I'm just scared that you get a pen test report. So now they're in your system. But uh, I look, I guess we have a few minutes left. And the idea is, okay, so you have no control over this. Like, I mean, I, I don't control the, the private entity. The, the other problem is I was listening to the presidential press conference, whatever the national security people were talking about. And it seemed like the problem was an, a non-updated system. Like it was a variant of something that happened months ago that we're told to update. So again, you can't stop any of this. You can't stop the water treatment plant. You can't stop this, but you can stop your own things. And we keep on telling you the best way to do this is first keep everything updated. No, first thing, have a backup. <clears throat> I mean, that's the whole point of ransomware. Have a backup of everything. Um, automate the backup that may cost money have your hard drives. The problem with the hard drives is you got to remember to do it, um, but have it on whatever it is, every Friday night to you have your weekly backup. We've spoken about this ad length. You can join our Sigma group. We can tell you that. Um, if you're a company, I, I, I guess insurance on it, uh, downtime insurance, whatever. I, I don't know what that's called. So if you do get hit, at least you're covered that way and you're not getting, or you're getting sued, but at least the insurance company will deal with it. And from there, then the other thing is to not get it on your system in the first place, which is, I guess, uh, which is just education of your employees, but it is attachments. So you got to be careful of that. Um, yeah. The, the if, stuff that we've spoken about in the past. Having having backups is the best defense to any of this stuff. And, and more, I, I would argue, I can't say more important than backups, but... Uh, uh, one of the most important components to this is not to just take the backups because, you know, to, to quote a, a famous Seinfeldism, anybody can take a backup or to paraphrase a, a Seinfeldism, mm -hmm. anybody can take the backup unless you are actively proving that your backup works, unless you are utilizing it, unless you are putting it through its paces and, and you know, running fire drills and making sure that you can actively recover from this, the backup is useless. Um, I, I have been, you know, unfortunately part of several data recovery efforts over the years where somebody did not take a backup uh, or or they were taking a backup. They had never tested it. And it turns out that, yeah, their, their backups either were backing up the wrong things, wasn't backing up anything at all. It was misconfigured. It was broken or the backups were just, you know, being corrupted all the time and they had never tested it. So how do you know? Right. Um, you know, I go through. Uh, probably a, a monthly process to make sure that, yeah, review my backup logs, make sure that the checks all pass, make sure that I can grab like an arbitrary file from a backup, um, you know, to just put it through its paces and make sure that the data you're backing up is actually going to be useful to you in the future. Um, take your backups, test your backups. 
I mean, if for the, the personal uh, people, or even if you have a small business, paying for some cloud storage, whether that's Dropbox, Google Drive, AWS, well, AWS, uh, OneDrive, I do really do like OneDrive and Office 365 and everything else. But Dropbox just came out with some plan. It doesn't matter what it is, but like you said, make sure that they version control what you're doing there. And that that's a feature that they all have. And that you're you're directing your employees, please save here, whatever it is, um, or yourself. I mean, if that's iCloud, whatever it is. So in case you do have a problem, you can uh, you can restore. I, we can't stop it against the the ransom of the data of the customer's data, but at least you have the data. I mean, if you can get that back, that's 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 key there. Then you can run your PR. The good news about all this, nobody seems to care. I still haven't gotten my Experian. My what is it? My Equifax hundred and twenty five dollars. I don't know if you remember that. Still have not oh, gotten yeah. it. I never got mine yeah. either. Because <laughs> that one hundred twenty five would have been really good to put into uh, cryptocurrency right now uh and into some doge which you should never buy note to self do not buy dogecoin i don't care don't buy it it's as bad as the pl- gas in the plastic bag do not do it but i wish i had that money because it was free because my data was stolen anyway but guess what so home depot lost my data and target lost my data and some bank lost my data and this entity lost my data so it's out there but at least i can have 125 dollars I'm I'm kind of wondering. This this is definitely an aside. Yo, know, data can just be created, right? It's it's not a truly consumable resource like oil is. And if you're saying that data is the new oil, well, if you can just create random fountains of oil everywhere, right? Then it's eventually going to uh, lose its lucrative nature. There's eventually going to be way too much supply of random data and not enough demand. And I hope that's kind of where the data economy crashes. But I mean, I yeah, I was going to say, I, I think we're of way far ahead of this. I think what needs to happen is some of these people need to get caught and to feel the law, lo- feel, feel a whole bunch of pain before they say, hmm, maybe this is not worth it. Yeah. Um, and again, if we're talking about ransomware, I do want to plug beeping, uh, bl- not beeping, bleeping hyphen computer.com because uh, they, they, they go through it and they post keys on how to decrypt certain ones. So if you get hit with a variant or whatever it is, they do have it there. Um, again, this is a fascinating story. I'd like to see what's going on. Hopefully they could come back up, come back up and running. The gas prices start to stabilize, all that other good stuff. Um, but it's going to take another week or two. So with that said, we're a little, we're over. We're going to end. We'll see everybody hopefully next week and have a good night. See you everyone. And stop. 367. 267.